Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Klieger. I'm the campus provost and executive vice chancellor here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Distinguished Alumni Award Ceremony with the Division of Social Sciences. Um, over the slightly over 40 years of the campus, the Division of Social Sciences has played a critical role in the development and success of our campus. Social science faculty are engaged in research on some of the most pressing issues of the day, from politics and economics to education and environmental conservation. And they're achieving some important recognition in each of these areas. Uh, in 1997, uh, a national study ranked UCSC social scientists as the first in the nation. The economics department recently ranked ninth worldwide in international finance program among 300 universities that were surveyed. And this year, the UCSC apprenticeship and ecological horticulture, which is part of the Center for Agroecology Agro and Sustainable Food Systems, took home the SUSTI Award, um, which is the top honor in this year's Ecological Farming Conference. Social Sciences faculty have been receiving many top honors within their fields, including the McGraw Prize in Education, the Kurt Lewin Award in Social Psychology, and um, last year, Elliot Aronson, Professor Emeritus of Psychology, was named one of the top 100 eminent psychologists of the 20th century. But the real measure of success of any educational program is the strength of the alumni, and the social sciences has an incredible list of alumni who have made their marks in many fields. To tell you more about one of these outstanding alumni, it's my pleasure to introduce the man who leads the social sciences division, Dean Sheldon Kamanyeki. Uh, Dean Kamenecki is new to our campus. He started here last August, but he's already done a great deal of work in strengthening the educational experience of our students and building support for our outstanding faculty. Um, Dean Kamenecki studies environmental policy, elections, voting behavior, and public opinion. Before coming to UC Santa Cruz, he taught at the University of Southern California since 1981, and he served there as political sciences department founder, uh, department chair and founder of the Environmental Studies Program. He received USC's highest teaching award and will be teaching a class here on campus next quarter, even though I told him that this is a mistake to do in the first year as dean. He's a tough guy and he'll do a great job. So please um, join me in welcoming Dean Sheldon Kamenecki. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Dave is one of the reasons I came to UCSC. Uh, during my interview, I thought he would be a terrific individual to work for. And uh, since I've come here, it's quite clear that I was, uh, I underestimated um, how good of an individual he, he is to work for. And so I really appreciate him coming tonight and, uh, and getting things rolling. Um, uh, many of our alumni have uh, made remarkable achievements uh, in the public and private uh, realms in government and business and arts, uh, music and nonprofit organizations, profit organizations, different forms of education. Uh, many have distinguished themselves in, in various fields, in the social field, the economic field, and the uh, political justice and equity fields, uh, or as leaders of industry. Uh, technology and, and so on. Um, because of this, because we've had so many outstanding alumni, uh, the interim dean uh, that preceded me, uh, Michael Hutchison, decided to uh, create an award uh, to honor our alumni. And last year, uh, as you probably all know, Dana Priest was the first recipient of uh, the uh, Distinguished Social Sciences Alumni Award. Um, uh, I want to thank those this year who uh, went out of their way to again nominate um, very um, well-known and, and well-deserving alumni. Uh, and I want to acknowledge particularly the work of the uh, selection committee. The committee worked quite hard going through various files. It was very competitive as you, as, as you would imagine. 
And I think they came up with a, a terrific choice, and I'm quite pleased with that. Um, the committee was made up of three alumni, three faculty members, an undergraduate, and a graduate student. Uh, the committee solicited input from faculty and staff and from the USC, uh, UCSC um, uh, alumni, uh, it's my former university, uh, alumni association. Uh, uh, we are fortunate to have many distinguished alumni from the social sciences division, but the, uh, the committee unanimously um, uh, chose uh, to honor tonight's honoree. Um, uh, Judge Kelvin D. Filer uh, from uh, the Los Angeles area, from Compton. Uh, uh, given that um, uh, uh, Judge Filer is a Superior Court judge, given the success that Dana Priest had immediately following her lecture um, uh, when she was honored, uh, we're expecting very big things from Judge Filer. Uh, uh, maybe the California Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court, you never know. We could be reading about him in the next few months or the next few years. Um, uh, Judge Filer graduated with a degree in politics from Stevenson College in 1977. Uh, he has said that he was drawn to UCSC by the narrative evaluation system, uh, the focus on liberal arts, and the absence of fraternities. Um, I, I noticed you didn't say sororities here, just fraternities. Um, uh, also, he, he, he told me last night at dinner uh, that he also was, was amazed by the, how beautiful the surroundings were, the ocean, uh, the beautiful redwood trees on campus, and, 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 um, and just a vibrant intellectual community at the time that he was um, looking for a place to study. Uh, following his graduation from UC Santa Cruz in 1977, uh, he graduated, he uh, went to uh, law school uh, up at Berkeley uh, at the Bolt Hall School of Law and graduated there. Uh, he worked in the state uh, public defender's office in Los Angeles before entering private practice in Compton. Uh, at the young age of 27, um, Kelvin Filer won a unanimous decision before the California Supreme Court in People v. Taylor, uh, which established the right of the accused to wear street clothes in court rather than jail blues, quote unquote, which could prejudice jurors. Uh, in 1993, he became a commissioner of the Compton Municipal Court, and so he was a pretty much a fill-in judge. Uh, and uh, this experience, uh, working uh, as a judge, uh, made him become much more interested in the occupation, and uh, he uh, began quietly, uh, diplomatically pursuing a Superior Court judgeship, and and was finally chosen uh, by Gray Davis to be on the Superior Court judge. Um, uh, he was chosen in, uh, began in 2002, uh, and um, he is today a highly regarded judge in the Compton District. He's known for dispensing justice with integrity, fairness, uh, and compassion. Uh, complementing his outstanding legal career uh, is his lifelong commitment to civil rights, social justice, and educational advancement. And this broader, uh, these broader interests, I think, were very attractive to uh, the selection committee, I am sure. Uh, he grew up in a family strongly committed to the fight for civil rights, uh, some of which we talked a little bit about last night at dinner. Um, Judge Filer has carried that commitment for justice throughout his career and through his ongoing outreach to uh, uh, students uh, from the neighborhoods where uh, he grew up. Uh, he's a very popular speaker at elementary schools and high school classrooms uh, where he encourages young people to stay in school and prepare for college. Um, I, he, I think here tonight uh, he, stand, we, he stands in front of us as a terrific role model uh, for, um, for um, uh, minority students um, that uh, clearly if they work hard and they pursue their dreams, uh, they too can be very, very successful in their lives. Um, he has said that I may not be able to change the world, but I may be able to change my little corner of it. And I think that's probably a good philosophy. Um, hopefully most, most of us uh, feel the way, that way the same. Uh, uh, he brought with us, him, uh, although he's not taking credit, this incredibly warm weather we've been having. I keep, we keep telling their family it's never, it's hardly ever like this, and it's been very, very warm. Um, but he also brought something else along with the warm weather. You don't always have to have sunshine when you have warm weather. You can, it can be cloudy. But he's also brought with us a bright, 
um, ball of sun. And it's, and it's glowing today on our campus because of the kinds of achievements that uh, uh, we're all proud of that Judge, Judge Filer has accomplished. Uh, tonight, we recognize Judge Filer for his positive in impact on his community, the state, and beyond. Uh, his professional dedication as a judge and his exemplary contributions to uh, society. So please join me in welcoming and honoring the winner of this year's Distinguished Social Sciences Alumni Award, Judge Kelvin D. Filer. I, want, I would like to present Judge Filer with a plaque. Um, that says um, UCSC Santa Cruz Distinguished Social Sciences Alumni Award 2007 presented to Kelvin D. Filer, Stevenson 1977 Politics uh, Division of Social Sciences at UC Santa Cruz honors you for your uh, sustained and exemplary achievement through research, practice, education, policy, and service as an alumnus. And again, we want to congratulate you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheldon, for that very kind and generous uh, introduction. And in essence, he pretty much gave my remarks for the evening. So I think we can go ahead and call it a night if you'd like. But in all seriousness, let me uh, indicate to the Executive Vice Chancellor, David Klieger, to Dean Sheldon Kamenecki and his beautiful wife Cindy, to all of the UCSC professors, the UCSC alumni, all the family, friends, and particularly to any of the UCSC students who were here this evening. My name is Kelvin Filer, and I was born, raised, and educated in Compton, California. Now that is the way I start off every presentation that I ever give. I introduce myself and I say I'm from Compton, California. I don't say I'm from an area in Southern California or from a suburb of Los Angeles. I say I'm from Compton, California. And I was born, raised, and educated in Compton. And the reason I do that is because we oftentimes hear all the negative things about Compton. You hear about uh, the gangs and the uh, rappers and the violence and problems that sometimes afflict the city. Uh, some of those things are true and some of those things are accurate. However, I think that far too much attention is paid to those things as opposed to any of the multitude of positive uh, things that come out of Compton. And so uh, I feel that uh, in honoring me, you are indicating that I'm a positive thing coming out of Compton. So I need to say that I'm from Compton. Uh, and I'm truly honored uh, to uh, receive the award, although I'm sure uh, Sheldon will uh, indicate to you and back me up that when he called and told me that I had received the award, the first thing I said was, why? Uh, I wondered why. Why was I selected? Uh, I was just doing uh, what I felt I was called to do in life. I was having a great time. I was uh, giving back to the community as best I could. Uh, but he uh, provided some reasons, and uh, after I thought about it, I said, well, I guess that's pretty good. <laughs> so uh, thank you. And uh, I truly am honored, uh, but more than that, I'm humbled by the uh, recognition. Uh, but what I thought about is, when you're honoring me, you are honoring uh, also the city of Compton. And the city of Compton deserves it. You are honoring my parents, and my parents deserve to be honored. You are honoring my siblings, and I think my siblings deserve to be honored. You're honoring my teachers, my church, my neighborhood friends, and all of them uh, deserve to be honored. You are honoring my two beautiful daughters, and they certainly deserve to be honored. And you are honoring UC Santa Cruz, and UC Santa Cruz truly deserves uh, to be honored. So uh, I stand before you uh, humbly and in indicating thank you very much for recognizing uh, me this evening. Uh, now, I do want to also point out a couple of friends, uh, because I've always felt that uh, having my family members and friends uh, that have surrounded me, surrounded me has been a blessing my entire life. And I do want to thank them publicly for uh, coming here this evening uh, with me and to uh, be with me as I receive uh, this recognition. I certainly want to uh, thank my mother, Blondell Filer. Mommy's here. And 
Two of my sisters, Stephanie Hoxie and Tracy Filer, are here. I have my law school brother, Dwayne DeJoie, with my godson, Pascal. They're here. I have another law school brother, and see, we're all brothers. And that's Samuel Torres. Samuel Torres is here. Thank you, Samuel. And then I have a friend, a uh, lifelong friend, that I actually met here at UC Santa Cruz, and he was actually my roommate our second year at UC Santa Cruz, and he's here. But I think he thought that this was a roast, and he was going to be able to come up here and talk about it. I mean, that's Mark Prever, attorney Mark Prever. Thanks, Mark, for coming. So they are all a part of my blessing, truly, and I appreciate having them here. Now, I was looking at the flyer that was uh, prepared and, uh, by, uh, I'm assuming Jennifer did this. It's a beautiful fl uh, flyer, and it has, as the title of uh, my little talk, what is our legacy? What is our legacy? And I'm here to tell you, I don't know. I have no idea what our legacy is. And I don't have the answer to that question, and I don't think that there is one answer to that question. I think we have to ask, well, what do we mean by legacy? Uh, first off, and if you uh, do what I oftentimes do when I don't know the meaning of a particular word, I do uh, look in the dictionary, and uh, Webster's uh, specifically defines legacy as something handed down from an ancestor or from the past. So that kind of gives you an, an, an indication as to what we mean when we're talking about a legacy. But can we say what is our legacy? Can we talk about a group legacy? Who are we talking about in terms of leaving things to? Is there such thing as a group legacy? Uh, do we say what is our legacy? Do we say where is our legacy? Should we talk about uh, uh, our corner of the world? What uh, part of the uh, society are we going to impact by leaving a legacy? Those are all legitimate questions that I think we should ask and ask of ourselves. And that's why when I provided the title, I made sure that they had a question mark behind it. Because it's a, a, a question that I want to make sure that I indicate to you up front that I cannot answer. I can't answer that question. And I don't know if anyone can really answer the question, and I really don't know if it's appropriate to pose it as a question. I think it's a rhetorical question. But the issue is one that I think that all of us should ask ourselves, not particularly looking for a specific answer, but to ask ourselves in terms of what are we going to do next with our lives? What should we do next with our lives? What would she do next with our education? I think in, in key passages of our growth and our development that it, it is appropriate to ask ourselves, well, why am I here? Why did God put me on this earth? Who am I supposed to help? What am I supposed to do? How long am I going to? All those type of questions, I think it's good and healthy to ask ourselves of those questions. And I particularly think that it's appropriate to ask them when we reach the college age. Uh, I think uh, those questions are uniquely posed by uh, the atmosphere that's provided uh, by colleges and universities. Uh, what are you going to do with your life? What is your next career goal? Are you going to go to graduate school? Again, those are all the same questions that uh, we are asking and we should ask ourselves when we talk about uh, what is our uh, legacy. So I would uh, encourage uh, the students here to uh, make sure that you, during the important periods in your development, when you're about to make important decisions, just think about what is my legacy going to be? What do I want to do? What am I going to leave behind? And who am I going to leave it for? Ask yourself those type of questions before you proceed to the next phase uh, in your uh, growth. Uh, and looking back, I think I asked myself that uh, question uh, when I was actually in elementary school in terms of, well, what do I want to be when I grow up? And Strange as it may seem, I pretty much knew in the third grade that I wanted to be an attorney or a lawyer. Strange as it seems, at that early age, I knew that, that this is what I wanted to do. And um, I'll tell you why, it's a little different. My, both my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement. My dad was president of the NAACP for three uh, uh, terms. 
Uh, they both were very involved in the local civil rights movement as well as the statewide and national civil rights movement. Uh, at the March on Washington, not only was my father part of the California delegation, but he carried the California flag. Uh, so they both have been very involved in civil rights and the struggle, particularly the struggles in Southern California. Now at that time, the NAACP was a smaller organization. They didn't have office buildings. They didn't have permanent locations. Uh, they didn't have secretaries. Whomever, my mother was the secretary because she had to be married to the president. So she, it's her turn to be the secretary. And they would put out their newsletters through the old mimeograph machines. They didn't have the executive offices and suites that they now have. Uh, well, at that time, they used to hold the meetings in the homes of whomever it was that was president. And me being the tag-along uh, boy to his dad that I was, I tagged along with my father. I was always going wherever he was going walking wherever he was walking. Uh, in fact, uh, this is the uh, honest to God truth, I was walking picket lines before I could even walk because my father was uh, picketing anybody, any group, whether it be Bank of America, J.C. Penney, Woolworths. If he went to a hotel and he didn't see any black waiters, he would ask him, do you have any black waiters? No, he goes out to the car to get his picket sign. <laughs> and he was carrying me before I could walk in picket signs. So I walked to pick picket lines before I could even walk. Uh, but at that time, I would always hear my father, Mr. Baskerville, uh, Douglas Dollarhide, Doris Davis, all of these individuals who were very active in the local NAACP, uh, before they would make decisions in terms of what they were going to do from a, st a strategic standpoint or what their next tactic was going to be, they would always say, well, what does the uh, lawyer say about this? Or have you run this by the attorney? Uh, are, we, are we making sure that everything is appropriate with our legal counsel? So right away, my uh, curiosity is sort of piqued as to, well, who is this person that they're talking about? Because whomever it is carries a lot of influence. And uh, people respect because they're asking about what does that individual think? Uh, so I uh, quickly learned uh, what an attorney does, what a lawyer does. And at that time, my father was actually going to law school as well. Uh, he was uh, very involved, again, with uh, uh, local politics. He was working, uh, but he's also going to law school, studying to be a lawyer. Uh, the law school he was attending is no longer in existence, but nevertheless, he was attending at that time. So he pushed me, I think, also in that direction, indicating that uh, the uh, law is a good field for you to uh, investigate. So as an elementary school student, and my teachers, I've met some of them afterwards, and they said, yes, I remember you, and you were. When you were a little boy, you were always running around talking about you were going to be a lawyer. And so I was. And I knew at an early age uh, that that's what I, one of the things that I wanted to do with my life. So um, unintentionally, I guess, I was asking myself, what is my legacy? What is my legacy going to be uh, at that early age? So after learning the requirements, uh, what it takes to uh, be an attorney uh, through uh, attending not only college but law school, um, I knew that again at an early age. So I, I distinctly recall graduating from high school and, and uh, graduating from Compton High School, that it wasn't that big of a deal to me at all. Uh, a lot of people were excited and they were happy, and they should be. Uh, but to me, I was saying, what is, what's the, the uh, celebration for? This is just one of at least three more steps for me. Um, because I knew that college awaited as well as uh, law school awaited. And college was not uh, an option because both of our parents stressed education and my oldest sister went to college and my older brother went to college and I was going to college so it was something that uh, was expected of all of us. And so at this time though I do have to again ask that question and uh, not only what do I want to be because I had made up my mind that I pretty much wanted to be an attorney but how do I go about accomplishing this aspect of my legacy? Where do I go? And uh, I picked UC Santa Cruz. And I just remember that I wanted to stay in California because I knew that I wanted to go to a California law school because I knew I wanted to pass the California bar exam examination so that I could practice law in California. I knew that. So I wanted to stay in California, and I knew that the UC system was an excellent system. And at that time, uh, UC Berkeley was the most popular campus. But the second most popular campus was UC Santa Cruz. And so at that point, I became interested in, well, why does everybody want to get into UC Santa Cruz? Uh, I didn't know anything about it other than it was up near Monterey. Uh, they had good weather. I did look at some of the pictures and saw that the campus was beautiful. 
uh, it was 377 miles from my mother's doorstep. So I was getting away from home, but I wasn't getting too far in case I, I got homesick and, and wanted to come, come back. Uh, but in looking at the pictures and looking at the campus, uh, I did realize they didn't have fraternities, and uh, I was, my thought was I didn't want to be in a fraternity because I wanted to make sure that I could interact and deal with everyone and not be limited because of any fraternal organization. Uh, I remember that they had the college cluster system, and that was very attractive to me because although it was a, a nice size university, about 6,000 students, uh, with the small smallness and uh, college cluster system, you would have an uh, interaction with the same group of people during meals, uh, social activities, and uh, particularly if you took classes at that college, uh, the ratio, I believe, was one uh, professor for every 23 students, which meant that we would get a lot of individual attention. So you see, Santa Cruz is very attractive to me. And uh, I uh, uh, enrolled, applied, and I was uh, accepted, and I got in my Toyota and came to college. And I'll never forget driving up the hill, and right at, I believe it's high in Bay Street, there's a sign, and that sign is still there. It says, University of California, Santa Cruz. And the first thing that went through my mind was, where is the school? Where is the college? Where are the buildings? All I saw was a barn off to the left. <laughs> so right away, I'm starting to wonder, did I make a mistake here? I did, you know, it was pretty. It was, and even when I came up to the campus, it was pretty. You could see the ocean, the hills, the, the, the air was clean. Uh, just a beautiful campus. Uh, but I'm wondering, well, did I make a mistake? And uh, then I had to endure uh, some culture shock uh, socially, uh, coming from uh, the city of Compton and uh, coming from Compton High School. Um, this is my first time away from home. Uh, Compton at that time was probably 90% black. Uh, I had 750 uh, students in my graduating class, 700 of whom were black. And I'm coming to uh, UC Santa Cruz and uh, there's a total student population of approximately 6,000, and at that time, 150 of the students uh, were black. Um, there were four black students at Stevenson College, and I was one of them, one of four students at Stevenson College. Uh, so it was somewhat of a culture shock for me. It was also an academic awakening for me. Uh, I told you I graduated from a class of 750, and I was number 13 in that class. Uh, my sister uh, graduated five years ahead of me. She was the valedictorian of her class. My brother graduated three years in front of me. He was on the honor roll uh, at Compton High School. I was on the honor roll at Compton High School. I, I was a good student, so I thought. I was top of the top of number 13. Now the class was 750. And yet, when I got to Santa Cruz, lo and behold, did I realized that I was just one of many. And um, for the first time in my academic life, I experienced failure. And I distinctly, um, I don't know if they still have the core courses uh, where uh, you have to take a certain number of courses, read a certain number of books within a certain, uh, short period of time. Uh, in the first book that we had to read or the first passage we had to read and write out uh, your paper in that blue book. And I distinctly remember the professor writing back you are having serious difficulty in understanding the basic concepts of Marxism. That's exactly what he wrote on the paper, that I was having serious, I had never been told that before from an academic standpoint. And to top it off, I spelled Karl Marx with a C as, instead of a K. I didn't know. So I was a little upset at my school, I was a little upset at my school district saying that I felt like I wasn't adequately prepared, but I don't think that that was necessarily the case. I just think that um, it was a challenge, and it was one of many challenges. And uh, luckily, I had uh, this sort of uh, support and guidance from my parents, and that's what they told me. Don't worry, it happens to all of us. Just uh, do better next time, so long as you do your best. And my dad has always told all of us, so long as you do your best, that's all you can do. Uh, but I'm a little hard-headed, and uh, that was a blow to my ego, to be very frank. So um, I sensed that that was a challenge for me, and I've never been afraid of challenges. And I proceeded to not only learn and study uh, about Marxism in depth, and about Karl Marx, spelled with a K, uh, in depth. Ultimately, when I took my oral exams at Stevenson College, and the orals were you picked the topic, and you went in and talked to 
uh, your professor, I think it was three or four hours, about that particular topic. Uh, well, uh, my topic was uh, the U.S. Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Vietnamese Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and how they reflected the principles of Marxist theory. So my thought was, I'm going to show anyone who challenges me, I'm going to show them. Not only can I learn and overcome any difficulties in understanding the concepts of Marxism, that was my oral exam. And I not only passed the oral exams, but I ultimately graduated with student honors from Stevenson College. Uh, so again, though, I think it's because I had asked myself this question in terms of what was I going to do, what was next, uh, that I know that in reaching and trying to achieve those uh, goals, you're going to have challenges. And you have to be prepared uh, to overcome uh, those challenges. Uh, but I love uh, my time here at UC uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, we had a great time. Mark would tell you it's just the greatest place in the world, uh, not only to get an education, but to make uh, lifelong friends and to really have some fun. I mean, Stevenson Thursday Night Movies, driving down to Davenport to get some beer with Mark and Alex, and they made me drink it, Mommy. I, it wasn't my thought. Um, we just had a great, great time. But again, I knew that there's a time and a place for everything. And again, I'm knowing that I'm going to law school, so I had to do well academically. And um, I felt that UC Santa Cruz also helped me to develop the discipline uh, that I was going to later need and use in law school, because with all the potential distractions, uh, if you're going to do well, and if you're going to get written evaluations, and that was one of the things that I liked uh, about Santa Cruz. You were going to have to do the work, put in the work, read the books, and be prepared to, to either write uh, essays or respond to oral exams. Um, so in doing that, you develop a discipline to set aside the fun, to set aside the distractions, and to really learn how to focus in on your studies and uh, uh, do well on uh, any particular issue that you might be studying at that uh, time. Um, and I, I think Santa Cruz certainly contributed to helping me to develop that type of discipline. Uh, but again, uh, just the friendships that I made that are, that are still uh, evident. Uh, I met my future wife there, and as I stated earlier, we have uh, two beautiful daughters. Um, just the whole atmosphere uh, of uh, being in the Bay Area uh, really made me appreciate the education that's provided here at UC Santa Cruz. Now, I was concerned somewhat in knowing that I was applying to law school that we did not have grades. And uh, the law schools generally do look at your grade point average, they look at your um, personal statements, and then you look at your LSAT scores. Uh, however, again, in uh, doing some research and talking to other students that had come from Santa Cruz and gone on to law school, uh, I came to learn that uh, actually Santa Cruz had an excellent, and still has an excellent, track record in terms of uh, providing students for the top uh, law schools. Uh, so uh, I, I felt very fortunate again uh, to uh, have uh, been here and been in a situation where I could take advantage of that opportunity. And uh, even after attending BOAT and serving on the admissions committee, I learned firsthand that that was in fact true. Uh, in talking directly to the admissions uh, director, she said that no, we think very, very highly of Santa Cruz students. They have always done well uh, at Berkeley. Uh, in fact, um, some of the uh, UC Santa Cruz grads who've gone on to Berkeley and done well, Jerry Ruiz, who's now uh, an attorney and, and one of the chief officers for Wells Fargo Bank, Terry Jackson, a good friend of ours, uh, who graduated the same year, uh, 1977. She's now a judge uh, in San Francisco. Steve Cochran, who graduated from UC Santa Cruz, who is a dynamite defense attorney, handles all the big profile cases in Southern California. Mark Prever, my college roommate, who's now an excellent attorney in Los Angeles, one day going to be a judge. Uh, his wife is also currently a judge, Laura. So Santa Cruz has an excellent track record in terms of preparing individuals uh, for uh, law school. Now again, law school is another passage where I'm thinking, well, what is my legacy? Uh, how am I going to go about Come, giving something back to the community? What am I talking about uh, when I'm going to law school? Uh, why should I pick one school over the other? Uh, and I was fortunate in that I was accepted uh, to UC Davis, UCLA, Loyola, and Hastings Law School. And in fact, just to show you how things work, and I've always felt that I, I've had an angel looking over my shoulder because I've been so close 
to going the wrong way, and uh, I've always ended up going the right way. So I, I really, truly feel blessed uh, because of that. So I'm very, very thankful uh, uh, for all of the circumstances and instances when I've had to make certain decisions. Uh, I've seemed to have made the quote-unquote right decisions, and one of which, of course, was attending UC Santa Cruz. Uh, but another was uh, in making the decision to go to Berkeley. I really wanted to go to UC Davis. UC Davis had an excellent law school. It was named after Martin Luther King. All the law students received keys to the library. The library was open 24-7. Uh, I attended an orientation uh, one Saturday, and it was the same Saturday that I received a letter from Bo. And in riding the bus up there, I opened up the letter and said, oh, congratulations, you've been accepted to the class of Bo Hall. And I said, oh, good, and there's another, this is my last acceptance letter. And I said, oh, good, another option. But I was very impressed with Davis. However, uh, there was a student there, a second year student at Davis, and he didn't say anything negative against Davis, but he asked me just in passing, he said, so are you going to come to Davis? And I said, yes. He said, well, what other law schools did you get into? And I said, well, I just got an acceptance letter from Berkeley this morning. And he said, what? I said, I got an acceptance letter from Berkeley this morning. I didn't realize that Berkeley's law school was held in such high esteem and that it was a top 10 law school at that time. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, go to Berkeley. He said, we'd love to have you here, Davis, but you have to go to Berkeley. If you got accepted into Berkeley, you have to go. And really ironic that uh, this individual told me that. His name is Les Brown. And it turns out he's now a judge in Los Angeles, a very good friend of mine. He ended up marrying uh, one of my uh, law school classmates, Terry Martin, and now they're married. She's an attorney in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so it's just uh, ironic that he saw me, he knew that I was interested in going to Davis, yet he felt that it was important for me to go to Berkeley if I was accepted into Berkeley. So I did. I attended uh, UC Berkeley and uh, made it through uh, three years and uh, was fortunate enough to uh, take and pass the California bar examination in 1980. Now, the bar exam, as uh, most of you know, is a very rigorous exam. I don't like to call it difficult because that sometimes can scare people off. Just like I don't like to say law school is difficult. Uh, to any of you aspiring lawyers, don't be intimidated. You can do it and you can make it. But law school is uh, rigorous and it is tedious. Three things to remember about law school. The first year, they're going to scare you to death. Second year, they're going to work you to death. Third year, they're going to bore you to death. So just keep that in mind. Make it through that first year, you're OK. If you can make it through that first year, you're OK. Uh, so we made it, Dwayne and I, uh, through uh, our Berkeley uh, Law School. And in 1980, of course, uh, I had to take the California bar exam. And um, in preparing for that exam, Again, maybe I need to, to digress for one moment and point out that I was very familiar with the California bar exam. Uh, I told you earlier uh, that uh, my dad uh, was uh, a law student uh, at the time when I was in elementary school. Well, he graduated from law school, and he, start, he took the California bar exam while I was still in law school. Now, we, were little, we really didn't know what it was. We just knew that uh, twice a year, daddy would leave for two weeks to take some tests. Um, now, you can, you can take it as many times, there's no penalty for uh, not passing. So he took it the first time and he didn't pass. Took it the second time, he didn't pass. Took it the third time, he didn't pass. Uh, took it the fourth time, he didn't pass. So this is going on. The bar is only offered twice a year. So twice a year, my father's leaving. He's gone for a week uh, to take the bar exam. And of course, we learned that that was the test that daddy had to pass before he could be a lawyer. Of course, by this time, I'm uh, graduating from law school, I knew exactly what it was, that it's the bar exam that everyone who wants to practice law in any state, you must pass that state's bar exam. And it is a, a rigorous exam. Um, but I was fortunate enough to take it and pass it in 1980. Now, the day I learned that I passed the bar exam, uh, I'll never forget that morning, because at that time, we didn't have the internet. Now the students can go on the internet and check and see if they passed or not. At that time, you would either get your results in the mail, or if you wanted to, you could drive up to the California Bar Office on 3rd Street, and they posted the names outside on the building at 6 a.m. in the morning. 
And if you wanted to go and see if your name was on the list, you could do that. 6 a.m. in the morning. Needless to say, I didn't sleep a wink the, the night before. And I left, and I know my mom and them tell me that they were everybody kind of knew where I was. It was uh, nobody was saying anything about anything. Uh, but I went uh, to go check the list. Now, I told you my father is continuing to take the bar, by the way. He hasn't passed. He's taken it twice a year in 1980. So, of course, I sat with my father, and we took the bar exam uh, together, as did my brother, who subsequently became an attorney. He also took the bar exam with my father. Uh, so I'll never forget, though, going to the F's and going down the list, and I saw Filer, Kelvin Dean. I just said, yes. Then I looked right up under there, and I didn't see Maxi Filer. So I had mixed emotions, because although I had passed, I knew right away that my uh, father had not passed. And then I looked, and I didn't see Dwayne's name, and that, that hurt me as well. Um, so the bar exam, though, um, was another turning point uh, in my life uh, in terms of passing it, and then being in the situation where I'm now able to again ask that question uh, at this passage of my life, well, what's next? We're talking about legacy. What am I going to do now? Well. Again, going back to uh, the qualities that uh, my parents had instilled in me, I knew I wanted to come back uh, to Compton. And I knew I wanted to do something to uh, contribute to Compton. And I knew, frankly, that I wanted to have my own private practice uh, in Compton. Now, at this time, I'm realizing, and partly due to the education I received and eye-opening experiences I received here, that when we talk about leaving a legacy, we aren't talking about material things. That's not what's important when we talk about what are you leaving behind. Uh, I wanted to do something to try and help individuals who were coming behind me, because I knew that the only reason I was able to get into UC Santa Cruz, and the only reason I was able to get into Berkeley, and the only reason I was able to go to these top schools and pass the bar examination to be in the situation I was in at that time is because of the sacrifices that uh, many people made and, and uh, lives that uh, were sacrificed to enable me to have, to have those opportunities. So my position was I have to try and help someone else to do the same thing, to reach back and help someone else. And uh, those are, uh, again, qualities that I'm, I'm so glad that uh, my parents have instilled in all of us uh, as uh, children and young adults. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's something that I don't see often, I don't say it's not entirely there, but I think that's something that I don't see as often as, as frequently as we should see in the current generation of uh, particularly people of color. Uh, they get in the situation, they accomplish something, and their attitude is, uh, I got mine, so you get yours. You know, I see these attacks on affirmative action or whatever you want to call uh, the phrase of trying to uh, equal the playing field, and, um, and I see them coming from individuals who had they not gone through affirmative action. I mean, Clarence Thomas, of all people, benefited from affirmative action. And here he is uh, talking about uh, pulling people up by their bootstraps. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely uh, ridiculous. And, and it's sad um, that we have to deal with that. But deal with it, we will. Deal with it, we will. And again, I, I was fortunate that, at least as an individual, uh, I knew that um, it wasn't about me. And it wasn't uh, just me. In fact, I was just a very, very small part of it. And if I wanted to be something larger or better, then I'm going to have to help some other individuals. So uh, after law school, I did. I worked two years for the State Public Defender's Office, only two years. When I was hired, I indicated to them that uh, I could only stay for two years because I was going to open up my own practice in Compton. That was going to be my dream, and I wanted to fulfill that dream. Uh, I was a little off because I stayed two years and three days. Uh, but from November of one year to November of the next year, I uh, worked at the state PD's office. And that was where I had the opportunity to actually uh, appeal a case uh, to the California Supreme Court. And uh, that was a tremendous experience for me uh, because uh, not everyone gets that opportunity. And in looking back, I was very young to uh, be arguing a case before the California Supreme Court. And again, the irony of it is this defendant, his name was Alonzo Taylor. And he was from Compton. And the case was assigned to me randomly, and it just happened to come to me. I didn't know him, but at one point he wrote me a letter and said, hey, my mom said she voted for your dad in the election last week. So his mother knew my father, 
And uh, the case, again, was dealing with whether you're entitled to wear civilian clothes in front of the jury. Of course, my argument was, uh, how can you have a presumption of innocence if you're sitting in jail blues that say LA County Jail? Certainly, if, some, if the jurors are to see that, they think he did something. He's in custody for some reason. So you are entitled, I argued you're entitled, to have the garb of innocence. And uh, uh, the decision, uh, I, I won the decision. And it was an 8-0 decision, unanimous. And it was written by Alan Broussard, who was the only African-American justice on the uh, Supreme Court at that time. Uh, so that was uh, a great experience. And it occurred right before I was leaving, because I was going to leave after two years. Uh, but I was able to do that, to have that experience, uh, to win that case. and. Um, also, ironically, in the interim period, the defendant committed another murder and pled uh, for 25 to life, so he didn't get out, even though the case I handled uh, on was reversed completely. He was still in, still doing a life term on another murder case. Uh, but in leaving the state PD's office and opening up my private practice, it was, a, it was just a great experience again for me uh, as well. Um, I also knew that this was an opportunity with a private practice to have some flexibility in some of the things I wanted to do. Things that I wouldn't be able to do if I were to uh, work for a law firm, because uh, I was my own boss, so I could make my own hours, I could make my own pay, uh, just so long as I hustled and, uh, and did my job. Uh, so I began to become involved in other aspects of the community. Uh, I became involved in civic affairs, uh, member of the board of directors of the Compton Chamber of Commerce. I served three terms as an elected official for the board of trustees for the Compton Unified School District made a lot of political connections that later uh, came in handy when I applied for a judgeship. Uh, I served in a leader capacity uh, and continuing to serve in a leadership capacity for my church, First United Methodist Church in Compton. I got married, as I stated earlier, two beautiful daughters living in Compton. And I just love the situation. I love the practice of law. I love doing criminal defense work. And I just love the challenge of uh, going against the state of California knowing that you're representing the underdog. So uh, I'm in an occupation that I thoroughly enjoy doing. Uh, I'm involved in the community. I feel like I'm giving something back. I'm going to the communities, uh, to the schools, to the career days. My dad is still taking the bar, but he hasn't passed it. But he's working as my law clerk. My mom comes on and works as my secretary and office manager. And she says that she was running the office. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but she was there. She did a tremendous job. And I paid her very well as a secretary. So after 11 years of that, though again, I've reached a phase where I'm going to ask the question, what's next? You know, what's, what's next for me? Um, what is my legacy, particularly as it relates to my career goals and career advancements? And I had reached a point where I wasn't burned out. I don't like to use that, phase, that uh, phase at all. Uh, but I had pretty much tried every case that you could possibly try. I uh, had uh, six uh, death penalty cases, every conceivable murder case, rape, robbery, you name it, I tried it. Um, and won my fair share of them, I'm proud to say. Uh, but it reached a point where I wanted to do something else and I wanted another challenge. And so I was actually approached uh, by the judges of the Compton Municipal Court and asked to apply for the commissioner's position, not really knowing what a commissioner did at that time, to be very frank. Uh, I subsequently learned that a commissioner basically is a judge. They sit as a judge. They do the exact same thing that a judge does. The only difference being that commissioners are appointed by the judges as opposed to being appointed by the governor. So I accepted uh, the challenge of being a commissioner, and I was hired. And I love being a commissioner. And once I got on the bench, then I said, this is great. Uh, I'm still involved in the law. I'm sitting up here. I don't have those horrendous hours. I don't have to beg clients for the money. I don't have to worry about in the middle of the night that I blow a statute of limitations. Basically, I'm sitting now, I'm making the decisions. Now, I took an oath to be fair to both sides, and I believe that I'm always fair to both sides. I always strive to be fair to both sides. I was a former defense attorney, but I made sure that uh, that didn't uh, influence or color my decisions. I uh, still believe in uh, following the law and in being fair to both sides. But I do think, in coming from the defense side, that uh, I can empathize with some of the issues and some of the practical concerns that many of the uh, defense uh, attorneys might have. And, and I think that's recognized and understood by both sides. Uh, but I'm proud to say that uh, I, I don't show any favoritism uh, as a bench officer. 
But in recognizing that I'm having so much fun as a commissioner, I said, well, I might as well apply to be a judge. Now, getting appointed by the governor is somewhat of a political process. Uh, I told you about my mother and dad's uh, civic affairs. If you hadn't guessed, they're Democrats. And uh, I was a lifelong Democrat. I was an ardent letter to the editor writer. I was published on a regular basis when I, before I became on the bench. And I was constantly arguing against uh, positions of Pete Wilson and George Duke Mason, uh, who are governors. And uh, Pete Wilson, in fact, was the governor at the time that I first applied. Um, so I didn't think I was going to get appointed. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't give the excuse of, well, you didn't submit your application. Um, so I, I submitted my application, uh, but I did not get appointed uh, by Pete Wilson. However, when Gray Davis was elected, all of a sudden I thought that my chances had improved considerably because Gray Davis uh, was a Democrat, and that is part of it, unfortunately, uh, to be very frank. Uh, it, it, is, it still is a merit appointment, and it should be a merit appointment, but sometimes to get your foot in the door, you have to know the right people. As it turns out, uh, Gray Davis uh, knew my father. Everybody knew my father. And in fact, Gray Davis had been to my house on one occasion. And I, of course, tried to remind his appointment secretary in a roundabout way of that connection. Um, but ultimately, after submitting my application, getting letters of uh, recommendations in, and, and just making those contacts that you have to make uh, when your application is pending, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, have been appointed by Gray Davis to a full-fledged judgeship in 2002 left me sitting right in Compton. Again, I'm hearing uh, criminal cases, long cause criminal cases, and I just absolutely love it. And my family would tell you they think I'm crazy because I look forward to going to work on Monday, and I do every single Monday, uh, but that's simply because I, I just feel blessed to have a job that I love going to. And I feel like I'm contributing. I feel like I'm contributing. Uh, so, and I'm proud of those uh, accomplish, accomplishments. Um, but, the reason I'm most proud is because I can go back to the schools, and I go back regularly. I speak at the elementary schools, I speak at the middle schools, and I speak at the high schools. And I want to let them know that if I did it, they can do it. And I think simply by uh, knowing uh, where I'm from and by uh, uh, knowing that uh, I'm now sitting uh, as a judge and that's something that I've always wanted, uh, they know that it's not something that's unattainable. And that's why the first thing that I say to them, when I come up, I say, my name is Kelvin Filer. I was born, raised, and educated in Compton. So they know I was sitting right where they're sitting a few years ago. So that's my legacy. Part of my legacy, I hope I'm not done uh, yet. Uh, but it's not money, it's not buildings, it's not material objects. And uh, as uh, Sheldon uh, quoted, Earlier, I, I, I know we can't change the world, uh, but I certainly do believe that we can change our little corner of it. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, where is our corner going to be? Is it going to be your child only? Is it going to be someone else's child? Is it going to be a class? Is it going to be a block? Is it going to be a neighborhood? Is it going to be a city? Is it going to be a county? Is it going to be a state? Is it going to be a country? I think a lot of that depends upon us. But I'm doing what I can to, to change uh, my little corner of it. And you never know who's listening to you. You never know who's listening. Uh, I can truthfully tell you that I've had at least, and this is at least, I haven't kept track of it, but I've had at least five attorneys who've handled the matter in my courtroom, and then they've asked to approach, and they've come up, and I said, sure, does it concern the case? And they say, no, it's something personal. And they'll come up, and they'll come up and shake my hand, and they'll say, I just want to tell you that you spoke at my career day 10 years ago, and that's the reason why I went to law school and I became an attorney. So you never know who's listening and who you might uh, touch. Um, so by the way, attorneys like to say, by the way, and let me digress, and all those type of words. Let me digress one moment, uh, thinking again of inspirational stories. Now, I told you, my dad, the most hard-headed person in the world, is still taking the bar exam. Now, I've passed the bar. I've had my private practice. I've been a commissioner, judge. My brother Anthony, gone to law school, passed the bar. Uh, my father is continuing to take the bar twice a year. 
Each time he failed, he failed, he failed. After 24 years and 48 attempts, believe it or not, he passed the California Bar Examination. And the, the whole city had a party. The whole, believe me. And it was, and this is true as well. I was on the Compton School Board at the time. Uh, this was right before I, I came on board as a commissioner. And we were in executive session. And the secretary says, uh, uh, Attorney Filer, your brother's out here and he's got his son with him and he says uh, he needs to talk to you right away. So I say, oh no, I'm thinking somebody's died or something because they are told to never interrupt us in executive session. And I go out there and I see my brother Anthony, he's holding his son Tony with an ear, uh, uh, smile wide, wide, and he just says, Daddy passed the bar. Daddy passed. Daddy passed. The secretary hears him telling me, Daddy passed. I'm saying, Daddy passed. They think he's died. <laughs> and we're all happy and excited. And that's the honest to God truth. So he went on and uh, he finally got his chance. And my brother has it on videotape where he walked to court. And he walked into a courthouse as a attorney, Max D. Filer. And that was a great feeling for all of us and for all the community. Uh, although, although, sometimes I still have to threaten to hold him in contempt because I don't know why he thinks he can just walk into my courtroom and just walk in and say, can I speak to Scooter? Call me by my nickname as opposed to showing. And uh, I, I have to put him in his place every time he walks into my courtroom because he doesn't address me properly. So. So uh, let me conclude uh, by again saying, uh, what is our legacy? I don't know. But we do know that it's going to vary with each individual. We know that that is a challenge that I hope uh, the students uh, get uh, from uh, my visit this past two days. And I've had a wonderful time, just a wonderful time coming back to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I do think we each should ask ourselves that question periodically. What is our legacy? What are we going to leave behind? And we each have to decide what it is that we're going to leave. We each have to decide who it is we're going to leave, leave it to. And we each have to decide what is our corner of the world uh, going to be? Where is your corner of the world? How can you contribute to society in a positive way? What will people remember you for? Let's ask ourselves uh, those questions periodically. What is our legacy? Now, I recognize that I'm uh, in uh, an arena of uh, academic excellence, uh, that uh, this is an institution of higher learning, and uh, that I have not uh, once, I believe, referred to uh, any of the great books, great minds, great authors of our time. I, have, uh, I hope I've not disappointed the students because I have not talked about uh, Nietzsche, or existentialism, or uh, any of those theories that uh, you are now studying, I, I hope uh, I haven't disappointed you in not quoting them or not making reference to them. But since this is uh, an academic arena, uh, I think it's only appropriate that I do conclude by quoting a great author and a great poet in our society. So in closing, let me quote that great philosopher, Sly Stone, the leader of Sly and the Family Stone, by saying, thank you for letting me be myself. We have a few minutes for some questions uh, of Judge Filer. Except for Mark, yes. Uh, we have two microphones on either end. Go ahead, come up and um, ask him anything except a pending about a pending case, and he'll answer you. That's right. Hello? Oh. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Sway, and I was just uh, really in awe of everything you've you know, done. I just had a, one question. Uh, when you were sitting on the bench, were you ever, you know, conflicted by your conscience? Well, that has happened, unfortunately. Uh, because as I indicated earlier, uh, 
I was very involved in local politics and civics. My parents, uh, we have a large family, so invariably uh, there are going to be individuals who uh, come in front of me and uh, I know them or I grew up with them and uh, I make that point known. I have to disclose that to the uh, opposing counsels. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I, the case was called, and the first thing I do is I look at the file, I said, People versus Bruce Johnson. As soon as I saw the name, I said, oh, no. And they brought him out, and I said, yes, there it is. And he, he walks out and says, what's up, Scoot? <laughs> Honestly, God, true, that's exactly what he did. And that happened, has happened with me on many occasions, so I have to recuse myself, meaning I can't hear that case. Uh, in terms of just generally being affected by cases, judges are human beings. Um, I, you will never see me on TV crying, <laughs> as my friend in Florida exhibited, uh, and I'm not criticizing him, but you will never see me uh, in, in that uh, fashion because you have to maintain an aura of impartiality and uh, proper decorum. But we're affected. Uh, we're affected. Uh, oftentimes, the hardest thing for me to hear and then decide upon and then ultimately a sentence. The hardest cases easily are the sex abuse cases because uh, they're very graphic and um, the photos oftentimes are very graphic. And I think because I have two little girls, when I hear about that, sometimes I do think back uh, as to thinking about them and, and just wondering, you know, how could someone uh, allow this to occur or how could this, this happen? So we're human beings, uh, but I think as a bench officer, you have to be able to say, I have a job to do here. And if you truly feel you can't do that job, then it's your obligation to indicate to both counsels that you, you can't hear this case. Um, and that's happened a couple of times. I've never done that, but that's happened a couple of times. But I've never been in a situation where I felt that uh, for emotional reasons or if it's a social case or if it's a political case, that doesn't bother me at all, not one bit. So I don't know if that answered the question, but yes, sir. I would like to make, uh, I'm Ray Glockernick, I'd like to make two brief comments and then a question uh, arising out of your outstanding achievement as an advocate in the uh, People versus Taylor case. Um, my first question, my first comment, it's a very personal one. <clears throat> I have a friend who's 72 years old who has a background as a university professor, an internationally renowned physicist, and now has a status of being in the Salinas County Jail facing capital charge. And I know him well enough to know that it is very meaningful to his dignity and sense of personal worth to be able to appear in court in uh, civilian clothing. And I wish to thank you for that contribution to his personal dignity. Thank you. Second comment is that one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Taylor case is that it made a significant contribution to the civilizing of our society in two distinct realms. One being the realm of our ability to have a fair trial. And the second being in the realm of the dignity that is ascribed to the individual, and particularly the individual who is legally closed with the presumption of innocence. And so out of that, I would like to ask a question of your thoughts or philosophy or any reflections that you may wish to share with us tonight about the relationship between dignity and liberty. Thank you. Oh, I think there is a relationship because as you so aptly pointed out, your appearances count, uh, first off. And again, we tell our jurors that they are to follow the law even, even if they might disagree with the law. And one of the key instructions that we tell them is the defendant sitting here is presumed innocent and he remains innocent until the people have proven him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, even if you think that they've proven him guilty by a preponderance of the evidence or that there's probable cause that he's guilty or that there's clear and convincing evidence that he's guilty, if you think that they've met that burden, then your verdict must be not guilty because the burden is a very high burden, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And if anything were to affect that, such as being in front of a jury wearing a blue jumpsuit that says LA County Jail on the front and the back, and, or in Delaware you're in chains, that's the subtle message that it gives to the jurors is that, well, we know he did something because he's in custody. 
And even if they know an individual who's wearing civilian clothes, even if they know that that person's in custody, they don't have that constant reminder of the blue jumpsuit. They don't have witnesses coming into court, and when they identify him, they say, oh, he's the person wearing the blue uh, jail jumpsuit, because that's exactly what would happen. But in, with the civilian clothes, at least there's an aura that uh, they're all people, they're all individuals. And in conjunction with that, I make it my practice, and again, I think this is where it, it's a benefit to have been a criminal defense attorney. Uh, there are some uh, bench officers, and I'm not criticizing them uh, for this, uh, but you will hear them say, um, and it's a common phrase where we're waiting on, the attorneys are here and we're waiting on the defendants to be brought up from the custody box. Uh, they'll say, uh, are the bodies up? Bring the bodies out. Well, I don't do that. I never do that because I think that dehumanizes them. Uh, I uh, ask uh, to bring in uh, so-and-so, Mr. Jones, and when I come out, I address everyone. I say good morning, and uh, sometimes if I see the defendants uh, uh, tied down, I'll compliment. You look very nice this morning, sir. Uh, because I believe that they should be afforded that dignity. Now, of course, if they ultimately go on, if they're convicted, then there's going to be a time and place for me to, to punish. Uh, because that's what our system requires. But up until that point, in making sure that they're afforded all their rights to due process and equal protection, and, and that was one of the basis for the court ruling as it did. The reason that the person's in custody is because they were too poor to post bail. If they were, came from a wealthy family, they were able to post bail, meaning they would walk in with their attorneys through the back door. And you notice defense attorneys always do that. They always wait outside with their clients, and then they come walking in together. See, that's a message, and that's, that's a great tactic. I did it, because you're telling the jury, my client's not in custody, and even though the jurors aren't supposed to think about punishment, you want to send the message to them, don't come back, don't send him to jail. He's in custody. Look, he's coming in with me. His wife and his kids are sitting in the back. That's a subtle message that you send to the jury. Well, if a person's in custody, they can't do that. And the jurors know because they, they file in and out, and when they come back in, magically there's a defendant sitting there. Uh, but I still think that uh, having the civilian clothes provides uh, against the subtle uh, and unconscious and subconscious uh, prejudices from seeing a person in jail blues. And I have no problems citing the case to the attorneys if they have a question about it. 31 Cal 3rd 488. And I got to tell you a story. Um, the O.J. Simpson case, without commenting on the case, uh, I did know all the particulars. Uh, in fact, a buddy of ours, Carl Douglas, was one of the defense attorneys. But I also knew Johnny Cochran, as well as Lance Ito and Christopher Darden uh, on the uh, DA side. But I'll never forget when they were arguing for O.J. to be able to wear civilian clothes even before the trial. See, the Taylor decision talked about during the trial, but Johnny and Robert Shapiro were arguing that, well, he's entitled to wear civilian clothes even at the preliminary hearing, and now everyone uses that argument. The reason being because of the camera, the television camera. All the prospective jurors are out in the community, they're going to be watching TV, and so he should be entitled to have those uh, jurors, potential jurors, see him in civilian clothes. And I'll never forget, and Johnny said, uh, yes, Judge, and that's the Taylor decision. I said, that's my case. Johnny Cochran, citing my case. So I, I enjoyed that little, little remark there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I particularly enjoyed uh, your comments about your childhood in the third grade that you already envisioned being an attorney. Yes. It seems to me that not only your parents, but the civil rights movement had a huge impact on shaping your purpose in life your mission, your destiny. Um, I was wondering if you think that uh, young people today in age maybe lack that same type of movement or purpose? Yes, I do. I'm not, I, and, and if, if they do lack it, what impact it has on them and what we can do as a community to try to, try to create that sense that I can only imagine, that the sense of, of need to fight and sacrifice and for things like social justice, that. I haven't, you know, maybe don't seem to be as uh, relevant, so if you just comment on that. There is a cultural amnesia. You're absolutely right. And I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, if I did, I would certainly try and market it and sell it. Uh, but I'm real, that's one of the things that really saddens me because so many of these, these young men and young women, they just don't get it. And they don't understand, as I stated earlier, that people literally gave their lives 
so that you could even have the chance to go to college and they won't even apply they won't even apply they make no effort and uh, I, I don't I don't quite know why uh, I do know that part of the uh, reason contributing to that is the the uh, lack of understanding and lack of appreciation of those sacrifices that's one of the reasons why I try and go back to the schools and I try and talk to the students and I particularly like going to the elementary school students because I'm not giving up on, on any group of students, giving up on any generation, but I have found that the bridge from a student deciding which way they're going to go when they reach that fork in the road is middle school. When you go to the elementary school, you generally will see students who are good students, get along together, and, and these are students, black, Hispanic, white, they all get along together, they're kids. Uh, they're going to school and they're being promoted, not graduating, they're being promoted to elementary school. And they're good kids, by and large. And then when you go to high school, you see those same kids, and they are totally different. Because we lose them in middle school. My personal theory is that's where we're losing them. And a, a lot of that blame goes on the parents. And I tell the parents. Uh, they're there taking pictures. They have these kids uh, dressed up uh, to... Uh, uh, be promoted. Uh, some of them are wearing caps and gowns. And when I go to the elementary school promotions, I kind of ruffle little feathers because I say, you're making too much of this. This is not a graduation. This is a promotion. They, it's great. We're proud. We're happy. But it should be expected that you should be promoted from the sixth grade to the seventh grade. If you put such an emphasis on it, my baby is being promoted, taking pictures, graduation gifts, bloom, all of that, they think they've done something when in actuality they've done nothing. Done nothing other than what they should do. And I try and encourage the parents that you have to stay involved. The PTA doesn't stop at elementary school. They have booster clubs in middle school and they have booster clubs in high school. Uh, so those are some of the things that, that I try and do and just hope that someone um, is listening. I don't know what it's going to take, but I, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head in terms of there's a lack of appreciation of the sacrifices that individuals have made. I mean, they all know about um, Martin Luther King's speech, uh, I Have a Dream, which is a tremendous speech, a great speech. And we hear it uh, ad nauseum during the month of February. I'm not criticizing that. But sometimes I wonder if the students who can recite the speech by memory because they have been told to recite it by memory or who know the speech uh, and have heard it hundreds, if not thousands of times, I wonder if they really know that that part of the speech was unscripted. And in fact, it, I Have a Dream is not mentioned anywhere in his original uh, draft and in the draft he had in front of him. The title of his speech was A Return to Normalcy. Nothing about a dream. He had given this speech before, though. He had given I Have a Dream speech before. But if you look at that footage carefully, and this part I do find fascinating, you can see he's kind of reading. And then he just kind of sets to the side, and he, and he looks up like this. And I'm told that Mahalia Jackson says, Tell him about the dream, Mark. And that is when he went in. And from what uh, uh, Ralph Abernathy and some of the others were saying, they were saying, oh, no, he's going to tell him about the dream, because they thought that was too controversial. But he sat, sat back and he said, I have a dream. And that's when he went into it, but it was totally unscripted. Now, I'm just wondering how many of our students know that? They know about I have a dream, but do they know the real reason for it? Do they know uh, the history behind it? They know about Rosa Parks, but do they know that Rosa Parks was a very well-planned and scripted occurrence? Do they know about the fact that we had hundreds of Rosa Parks in California arrested for the exact same thing before Rosa Parks? They probably don't. So maybe we need to let them know. And it can start with me not telling you, but me bringing it out and you going to tell someone else and they're going to tell someone else, and maybe we can. Uh, uh, change a couple of uh, opinions in our little corner of the world. So anyway, I didn't mean to, to get on, on my on soapbox. All right, time for one more, they say. Okay, I guess I'm the one more. All right. I, <laughs> thank you. 
Um, I would just like to say I really enjoyed listening to your uh, comments tonight, and I really appreciate what you do for the children in your own community. I think that's something that more people need to do all over. Um, my question goes to your time, prob maybe as an attorney, probably as a judge. What has your experience been, and what is your opinion of the three strikes law in California? I and, think. Oh, go well, go, go ahead. I'd like go to just ahead. like no, your go comments. Ahead. Okay. No, um, and, and I'll preface my comments by indicating that uh, as a judge, I cannot talk about any pending case, so I'm not talking about any pending case that might be either in the Court of Appeal or in the, uh, before the California Supreme Court. Um, however, I do have uh, my own views about uh, the uh, three strikes law, and I think uh, it was a poorly written law, although well-intentioned. Uh, it's too broad, and it needs to be modified and corrected. It's uh, ensnaring too many individuals who don't need to receive 25 years sentence to life. Um, and that's not what it's intended to do, but that's what it is sometimes being used for. And I say is sometimes, because it all depends upon the DA and how they're going to uh, handle it. Uh, again, one of the advantages, now that I'm up here, is I, see, I can strike those strikes, and I will. If I think it's appropriate, I'll strike them in a second. If a person's third strike is a drug case, Granted that person broke the law, granted that person was wrong, but they don't deserve to go to prison for 25 years. And if they're in front of me, they're not going to prison for 25 years because I'm going to strike two of the priors. And that's going to happen. And I'm not the only one. A lot of judges feel that way. Now, by the same token, if a person commits a robbery and that's their third strike, if they're convicted and those strikes are proven, they're probably going away for a while because that's what the law allows and I think that's what justice calls for. And that's what I try and do. Uh, in closing, I just try and, and be fair and administer justice and have some fun. Peace. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you very much. Don't forget your plaque. I'm humble, but I didn't want to forget my plaque. Don't forget your plaque. <laughs> Good night, everybody.